speaker today is Dr. Tulson, John Tulson. Uh, he has been doing this, guys, for 40 years, uh, pouring into guys. Uh, he has a book, The Four Priorities, that he uh, meets with guys about. They follow that. It's kind of a roadmap because if we don't have a roadmap, we can't get from point A to point B, can we? We don't know where we're going. And so that's what it's all about. I'm giving him a hard time because he's been on a fast for 21 days, so I set this chocolate cake up here Not just for him. <laughs> just so he can look at it, but we'll move it. I'm just going to give him a hard time. Uh, but he is a, uh, he's a great guy. And uh, uh, he was the Dallas Cowboy chaplain, and we have a few Dallas Cowboys in here. And uh, he just resigned from that because God is calling him to do a lot of bigger and better things for the kingdom. And uh, I'll let him tell you about that. He does have a book coming out called no, Take a Knee. You're done. So. I'm done. Huh? All right, well, I was trying to build you up, man. All right. I'm out of here. Hey, I think you need this. That's yours. All right. Uh, well, good to see you guys again. As, as I said the last time when I was here, uh, I, I do not come today uh, to waste your time. And I hope that, uh, I want to use this little thing because I've got a couple notes here I want to share with you. But how many of you all have um, kids in college? How many of you have kids in college? How many of you have kids in college and you hope they get out of college? <laughs> well, I, somebody sent this to me a long time ago, and a number of years ago, and apparently <clears throat> there was a, um, a couple that lived on the East Coast, and they had a daughter that wanted to go to school on the West Coast, but they were really frightened about that because they understood that all the funky stuff starts on the West Coast and begins to make its way back through Texas and this part of the country, the Midwest, and eventually all the crazy trends and craziness heads gets back to the East Coast. So, so they didn't want her to be exposed to all that stuff. But she prevailed and got to, got to go to school on the West Coast. So she's out there, a week goes by, two weeks, three weeks, no emails, no faxes, no phone calls, no letters, no nothing. Then one day, this letter came in the mail. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry that I've not written to you for so long, but all my stationery was lost the night the dormitory was burned down by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now. Doctor said my eyesight should be back to normal sooner or later. The wonderful boy Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his apartment with me till I found a new place to live. You always wanted a grandchild. <laughs> so you better know that you'll be grandparents next month, love Mary. And then at the bottom, there was a PS, and it says, please disregard the above exercise in creative writing. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in mathematics, and I wanted to be sure that you received this news in the proper perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll receive what I want to say. I hope you'll receive what I want to say today in the proper perspective. Uh, there are two messages that, uh, if I have a chance to speak to new audiences, that I always want to talk about. One is, uh, why do we need Christ? What has He done for us? And how do you get in on it? That's the one I, I love to talk about anywhere I go. The other night I was, somebody, a buddy invited me to go to Pine Cove at the last minute to speak to 115 high school kids, and I, that's what I did. Gave an invitation in, 30 of those kids accepted Christ, and now are gonna be with the Lord forever. I, there's nothing I enjoy more than that, except what I wanna talk about today. This is the heartbeat of who I am. Um, and you know, you mentioned, Jason, the word justification. Years ago, I studied under a man in Switzerland named Dr. Francis Schaefer, who helped me understand what that word meant more than I ever understood before. And you did part of what he said. And he said, basically, justification is a legal term whereby God declares a man free from all of sin and guilt based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, plus nothing else. So when I come to know Christ, my position before the holy God is I am free from all sin and guilt. Maybe I'm on my way. I went today. I'm there. He did it though. I didn't. But the point I want to make to build on is if I am that, if I am justified, if I am just as if I had never sinned in his eyes through Christ, then what in the heck ought I be doing? Why, you know, our country and our planet is already overpopulated. So why in the world does he leave us here? It ain't to take up space. I can tell you that right now. All right, here's another one. I sat down 
<clears throat> with one of the one of the greatest, I think, one of the greatest preachers in America three weeks ago on a ship. And the reason I had been invited, my wife and I have been invited on this cruise, to be, and our, our host, uh, the reason I took the opportunity, I'm really not big on cruises, but I wanted to sit down with this man, hopefully, that we could do some things together. And I sat down with this man, his name's Dr. Charles Stanley. I love Dr. Stanley. So we're sitting in his room, the last day of the cruise, we're talking. And I mean, this guy lights it up. He's 78, man, I mean, he opens that book up. You get the book, you get the Jesus, you get challenged, and you may be wiggling a little bit, tapping your foot, but let me tell you, you get it right in the eyes, which I love. So anyway, I said, Dr. Stanley, and I'll refer back to him in a moment, but I said, you keep telling us, there are about six, 700 people on this cruise and he, that he taught each night, and he said, I said, you keep saying that our nation's in a crisis, Christ is the answer, we as followers of Christ have the answer, but I said, my question to you, sir, is how are we going to get that out there to people? And then he said this to me. He said, John, what I've learned over the years is preaching alone is not going to get it done. I said, I 100% agree with you. I said, what do you think is going to get it done? And then we continued with our conversation, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I believe that Jesus Christ, when he left the planet, left us with a plan of how to change the planet. If one person in this room does what I'm going to suggest you do, you'll be batting about the national average. One, one out of every how many are here. Um, so with that in mind, I hope I will sufficiently sufficiently insult you and challenge you that you'll say, by golly, I'm going to do something about it. What I'm getting ready to tell you is the enemy does not want you to engage in what I'm going to talk about today. He wants you to stay neutral. He wants you to play it safe. He wants you to get engulfed in all the cares of your life and let those swallow you up and rationalize and say, I just don't have time. I'm not qualified. I really can't do that. I've never been to cemetery. I mean, seminary. I can't do all that stuff. I, and, and add to the list. Don't know enough. Got too much crap in my life. And on and on, the excuses will go. All right, let me dig in a little bit and add hopefully a little, a little substance here as we go through this today. It's very interesting. If you study the message of Jesus, go back to, back to uh, uh, Matthew 4 and 17, and uh, Jesus comes on the scene with his public ministry, and he says, here's his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It wasn't a soft message. It was a tough message. And if you, you know, Zig Ziglar preached that message all over, he wouldn't be, over the years, I've gotten too many speaking engagements. I mean, right in your face. But turn or burn. you got to get it right. That's what his message was. Then if you move over a little bit further, you say it was a tough challenge as you begin to look at Matthew. And I'm going to read a couple passages here. Matthew 4, <clears throat> right past that point where he kind of declared what his message was going to be. But in Matthew 4, beginning with verse number 18, it says the following. Uh... As Jesus was walking uh, beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, uh, and his brother Andrew. He said, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. It wasn't come, follow me, and you'll be warm and fuzzy. It wasn't come and follow, and we'll have little Bible studies, uh, have a little talk with Jesus. And he didn't say that. He said, come, follow me. There's going to be something that we're going to do, something that we're going to develop in you. There's an assignment. I ain't saving you just so you can sit back and say, yeah, I'm going to heaven, I'm in, baby. That's not it. He said, there's an assignment. And then, if you read on through that, you see he picks the other disciples and begins to develop them. Then, then he takes another step. Because if you go, for example, uh, to the end of Matthew, at the end of Matthew, he gives this incredible challenge, which we're going to talk about today. Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. Then he steps back in Matthew 25, and he tells them, when I give you this assignment and I leave, all hell's going to break loose. So I'm thinking, because I like to study leadership principles. So he gives them this incredible world-shaking uh, assignment. Then he says, all hell's going to break loose, and I'm leaving. So my question is, what in the heck did he do 
when he was with them to get them ready so that they wouldn't fold up like an accordion and that they would carry out the assignment that he gave. Well, the answer to that is right in the scripture. If you go back to Matthew as one of the examples to chapter number five, he begins a spiritual surgery. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. If you've not read that, you need to go back and read that if you haven't read that recently. So he begins to get the spiritual scaffold out, and the first thing he does in Matthew 5, 3, he says, Blessed, well off, to be envied, to be congratulated, are those who are poor in spirit. Now what he means by that is well off, blessed, is the individual man or woman who is willing to admit their spiritual bankruptcy before a holy God, not only initially when I come to Christ, but continually every day. That's an attitude. That's a deep character quality that he's developing. Then he goes on, I'll just give you one or two more of these. Blessed are those who mourn. It doesn't mean cry when somebody's dying or went through a tragedy. Mourn here means it's pentheo. And what it means is, Blessed, well off, to be congratulated is the man who sees his sin and he's sorry, and he's sorry enough to quit. Amen. This is deep stuff. Amen. One more. Blessed are the meek, not the weak. People have a lot of misunderstanding about what it means to be meek. Two major things the word meek means. Number one, it means power <laughs> under control. His control. It's like a quarter horse. The, a quarter horse, I grew up on a ranch, is a phenomenal animal. And you get on that quarter horse, it is so well trained, you don't put a bit in its mouth. It just has a rein, the reins around its head, the harness around its head. And it's so well trained that all the rider has to do is barely touch that neck, right or left, it, it, or it says, whoa, and boom, it stops. You don't have to put the pressure on the tongue in the mouth to make it obey. It's power under control of the rider. Another thing it means, Teach, meek means to be teachable. It means to have a spirit that says, not only do I want to get cognitive understanding of information, but I want to learn it to the point where I'm living it. And so, Jesus, if you go through 5 through 7, he begins to lay this stuff out. He said, this, I've got to get you ready on the inside so that when it comes time to step up and do what I've <laughs> left you on the planet for, he's saying this to you and me too, on the inside you'll be ready because if you aren't ready on the inside, you'll let the pressures of life dictate what you do. And that's what most men do. We've got men sitting all across this country and all across this city and churches that aren't even in the game. They're on the freaking bench. And we got to get to the point where we man up. We got to man up and get with it. And so, Jesus' method here was to change the world. He chooses 12 guys. 12 guys. Not a thousand guys, not a million guys, 12 guys. 12 guys. And one of them screwed up and pooped out on me at the end. Ordinary men. They hadn't been trained, highly trained in terms of theology or Bible or whatever. They weren't in some big fancy synagogue or church. Just normal guys, dirt under their fingernails. Three years he built his life into them. And he said, this is going to change the planet. Now, either that strategy, I submit to you, was stupid or it was supernatural. And I choose the latter. Yeah. So therefore, Jesus set a movement in motion, died to make it happen, was raised from the dead, came back, said, meet me in Galilee, and then uttered some of the most famous words of all time. He says, go, and as you are going, make disciples. There is no term in the Bible, in the New Testament, as far as I'm concerned, that is more misunderstood than that word, make disciples.